Hey you and welcome, 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 welcome folks. My name is Mike and in this old podcast, yeah, if you can believe it, it's another one. I'm going to tell you about the tale, the saga, the another word for tale, story, that's the word, of Marissa DeVault. Dev, dev, devo, devo. Uh, D-E-V-A-U-L-T. Okay, she's got to change her goddamn name. It's pissing me off already, as you can tell. This is a story from the hot lands, the bad lands, the bad boy lands of Arizona. What a place. Good to see you again. And it has innumerable. Okay, well, not actually innumerable. I could count them, so I'm lying when I say innumerable. But innumerable uh, similarities to another much more, you know, widely, much more famous case that I'm sure you've probably heard of, but this one is equally as crazy. And get a lot of this, they happened around the same time. What is in the water down there? I don't know. Will we get into it? Nah, probably not. I'm not like a hydro... hydro man. But anyway, maybe they're inspirations of each other. Who knows? We got, I mean, that's it. Two crazy ladies. What are you gonna do? We'll get into that. We'll hammer into it, actually. <laughs> Uh, actually, um, I guess kind of like Marissa did. But we'll also get into a pretty funny side of the story, which is when she faked her own attack. It, it's actually, it's a knee slapper. So look forward to that. But before I get into it, folks, I just want to, you know, say this is the That Chapter podcast. It goes along with the That Chapter YouTube channel. And I really hope you enjoy this podcast. As always, folks, you know, your enjoyment is my priority. But if I could ask you for anything, uh, please, you know, uh, leave a review, leave a star on the podcast apps you're using. It would help out incredibly mucho helpful to me. So thank you so much for that. By the way, if you do that while you're sleeping tonight, I'll come and give you a little smooch. Now let's give it a goo. The tale of Marissa DeVoe, it lives in like the shadow of, of, of kind of a similar but much more widely known case that a more youthful looking, I shouldn't have looked up the time when I covered the case of Jodi Arias uh, on that chapter because fucking hell, she's of age like milk. Um, so, but you know, J- Jodi Arias, uh, I covered that a couple of years ago on the channel. Chances are you probably know who she is. If you do, maybe a little spider just ran up your spine. She was lovely. She was a doubt if you like uh, absolute just friggin' fucking nutcases. Uh, you're in for a treat with that one. She was a friggin' headbanger, a psycho, a psycho hose beast, a terrifying, vicious psychopath, you know, hiding behind the ooh, you know, sweet little girl act. And then on the 4th of June 2008, to the apparent surprise of absolutely no one, um, well, maybe Travis, um, she repeatedly stabbed and then shot her ex boyfriend, Travis Alexander. Now, two things are very well known about that. One is the photo of Travis right before he was killed. It's a photo of him in the shower. It's it's very disturbing because he looks... He looks like he knows the end is coming. Equally disturbing is the sight of Jody singing in the interrogation room and doing all sorts of weird shite. And then, get a lot of this, these two cases were tried in the very same courthouse. Haunted? Question mark. I don't know. That one took place in Mesa, but for today's tale, we are heading just five miles south to Gilbert, Arizona. It's a town in Maricopa County. You know, something about that county just keeps coming up. Like, I feel like I know that name a lot, and it's never good. Well, okay, here. (laughs) Here's another story you can add to the list. Another reason to know that town. An affluent town, Gilbert. Gilbert, man, it's kind of like it. I don't really know anything about this town, but it sounds like nerds live there. It's a suburb of Phoenix, and proudly, they have this in this, like, big billboards everywhere because it was the former hay shipping capital of the world, if you can believe that. I know. Take a, take a seat. Sit down. I'll say it again. Former hay shipping capital of the world, guys. I know. I feel like this was, a, a, you know, Phoenix's best kept secret. And in 2009, it was the home of Marissa Devo. 31 years of age, and Dale Harrell, 34 years of age. Married for nine years, Dale and Marissa had dated briefly while attending Lake Havasu High School, where Dale was a senior and Marissa a freshman. Nothing, you know, nothing too serious, you know, they were young, and eventually they each went their own amicable ways, 
before they would reconnect by by chance years later in their mid 20s. Both, you know, both were from the outside normal, good looking, regular, regular ass folk. But they had two very different experiences in life. Marissa, who she grew up in relative poverty, and she had a child, Rhiannon, when she was just 17. Now, with the birth of her daughter, and it seems like the, the father wasn't sticking around, that meant she had little choice but to grow up quickly for the sake of her baby girl, and she was forced to take odd jobs where she could just to make ends meet. At one point, working at a strip club called Knockers. <laughs> nice, dude. And that's where she went by the name of Reese Cup, a play on her childhood nickname of Reese. Now, I don't know why, but that's just a very unsexy stripper name. Like, do you want a lap dance from Reese Cup? No. Now, she also took part-time classes at a local community college, and she bounced between majors, never sure if she, you know, she wanted to be a lawyer, an accountant, or maybe something else entirely. <laughs> hmm. Does Marissa want to be a doctor, a lawyer, or an astronaut? Yeah. Decisions, decisions. But one thing she did know was that she wanted better for herself and to move up and out of her current living situation. Godspeed on that one. Marissa would also bounce between men, getting into and out of several short, often turbulent relationships. That is, until 1997, and a chance meeting with Dale, former high school sweetheart. After high school, Dale had graduated from trade school and jumped feet first into his chosen profession as an air conditioning tech, and uh, honestly doing well for himself. Hey, Arizona be hot, he would take it upon himself to make it cold. I seriously wonder, do people make bank, you know, HVAC technicians? future career for Mike, question mark. No, I would die. I would melt in that heat. No lie. And when he bumped into Reese Cup, he was Marissa's chance at a better life and a better future. He had the stability she never had and could provide for her and her daughter. Dale, he was a practical joker, you know, by nature, but he knew when the time was to be serious. He was fun and he was steady. With Dale making more than like a comfortable income, they was cha-ching doing dollar dollar bills, yo. And he was, you know, he's, so they earn loads of money. He was thriving at work. The couple then, Dale and Marissa, would go on to have two, count them, two more children. A son, Kiernan, and a daughter, da, da, he, da, he, no, no, no. Um, yeah, something like that, I think. You know, I, okay, I, I hear you're barking, big dog. I know what you're thinking. What's with all the Welsh names out of interest? The answer to that one is... I have no idea. I really don't know. I couldn't find a Welsh background on either Dale or Marissa and Marissa's first child, you know, before she, before she like, got with Dale, had a Welsh name. So I presume it's her doing it's, it's, it's She's the problem here with all this stuff. You know, maybe she just likes the country uh, and their language. Um, maybe. I don't have any records. I can't imagine she ever went to Wales. But you never know. You know, get a load of this. I used to go to Wales often enough. Um, I would actually get the ferry from Dublin to Wales. It's like... It was a couple of errors, one error in a fast ferry, three errors in a slow one. Um, a beautiful place. It's nice, nice place, Wales. Um, but see, this is the thing with all the Welsh names. Do you ever try pronounce Welsh words? Just give it a Google. Give it a Google. It's it's a trip. Um, it's like trying to speak speak uh, Klingon through a mouthful of popcorn. So get a load of this, right? Dale was doing so well for his wife and his three kids that Marissa, she didn't really need to work, freeing her up to raise the children and when they were old enough, take on more, you know, college courses. The couple were even able to offer a room rent free to a friend, Amy Dewey, in return for Amy helping Marissa with the kids. They would repeat that when Amy left and they would take in another friend, Stanley Cook. He'd come in later on. And I mean, honestly, that's that's really, really nice offering friends a place rent free. They were they were doing well and they were happy to, you know, spread the wealth. And so from the outside, you know, they seem to be a perfect suburban couple, your average Gilbert residence, a beautiful couple with three kids, a success story. Hey, now uh, comes the inevitable womp. On the 14th of January, 2009, a Wednesday, at roughly 2.45 a.m., a call came in to 911 from 2149 East Maplewood Drive, a nice house in the quiet suburbs of South East Gilbert. 
The operator, uh, unable to understand the frantic woman on the other end of the phone, was only able to discern that there had been some sort of domestic incident and someone had been hurt. Officers from Gilbert Police Department arrived at the house within minutes, and they were greeted in the driveway by one Marissa, a Marissa who was frantically crying, screaming, and covered in blood. It was her who had called the police. She'd hung up the first time after frantically just screaming, roaring her head off down the phone. And so, the 911 operator had dispatched officers to the scene. And then, from inside the house came Stanley, Stan the man, Stan Cook, the couple's housemate and sometimes babysitter, helping out. Officers searched Stanley and found a 22 semi-automatic pistol. They managed to calm Marissa down enough to ask who else was in the house and was she injured. She told them her, her three children, they were in the house, along with her husband. And no, it wasn't her blood. Joined by another officer and their sergeant, the police proceeded to clear the house, going room to room where they found the two youngest children fast asleep in their beds, and Rhiannon, who was 13 at the time, awake, but safe and unharmed in her room. The same could not be said for Dale. Entering the master bedroom, the officers found a horror show. Dale was laid with his head propped up on the couple's nightstand, barely clinging to life, soaked in blood with a softball-sized hole in the right side of his head. A blood-covered claw hammer, the, the obvious weapon, had been left in plain view on the desk. In an effort to preserve as much evidence as possible before the medical responders came true, the officers, thinking quickly, took photographs of the scene. It really was a blood, blood-soaked blood nightmare. Like, it was like a big old grizzly bear had gone in and had been hungry. Outside, Stan and Marissa had been placed into separate police cars. And Marissa was taken to hospital. She was unharmed, but she was in shock. And there she was, you know, uh, hey, Marissa, riddle me this. Um, what the hell happened? We're gonna need an explanation on this one. And here was her explanation. Marissa would claim that years of violent and sexual abuse had led up to this moment. That Dale, he had it common. On the surface, you know, a great guy, a hard-working family man, but behind closed doors, he was a monster. But, big booty time, my friends. She would say it was actually Stan who had hit Dale in the head with the hammer. She told the officer that after she and Dale had argued, like always, they'd gone to bed. But this time she'd been woken by Dale in the middle of the night, his hands wrapped around her throat, choking her. She said it was Dale who had brought the hammer to the bedroom in the first place, almost used it on her, but he put it down when he calmed after the argument. Stan, you know, waking up in the middle of the night, he must have overheard commotion. He opened the bedroom door and witnessed Dale on top of Marissa, choking her. And so, he simply walked over to the hammer on the bedside locker and hit Dale in the head to save her life, smashing him. Okay, fair enough. I mean, well, not really, but I guess kind of. I mean, if that's the story, that's the story. But uh, then, during that round of questioning, Marissa first brought up a fella by the name of Alan Flores, a man she'd been having a secret affair with. Now, she didn't say this to the police that they were having an affair. She would say something else, uh, a bit of a different story. Who be Alan? Well, he was a Yale alum, a high-flying management consultant, and uh, all around a massive creep. Alan Flores was 20 years older than Marissa, and he looked it, an overweight, balding fella. They'd met through SeekingArrangement.com, a sugar baby dating website, which, um, folks, it's, it's exactly what you think it is. It's rich old men paying for the company, wink wink, of attractive young women. Now, these days, they've gone legit, and they've changed their name to Seeking.com after several High-profile scandals basically exposed their uh, secret, secret and seedy. Well, it's not so secret, but it's very seedy business model. Um, if you've seen some of my videos on YouTube, you will probably be familiar with them. They've come up uh, on more than one occasion regarding a murder. 
Now, of course, she didn't mention any of this to the police officers for, I guess, obvious reasons. Um, having an affair and then your partner ends up dead never kind of looks good. So instead, she made something up and she told them that Alan Flores was, in fact, the ex-boyfriend of her stepfather. And that's how Marissa and Alan knew each other through her stepfather. As she would also say, of course, her stepfather was dead. But she did tell the police that Alan, you know, he would back up everything she had told the police about Dale and the abuse. Alan could confirm Dale was an abusive asshole. And in fact, Alan had been so worried about her that he had given her a 22 semi-automatic pistol, which was the same pistol that had been found in the possession of Stan Cook when the police arrived at the house. Alan was so worried he wanted Marissa to be able to defend herself. Now, let's go back to Stan Cook. Stan the man, the only other person in the house at the time of the attack. And at first, he would corroborate her story, you know, giving the police little information other than, yeah, Marissa's telling the truth. I walked in, I saw Dale attacking Marissa, so I picked up the hammer and I hit him. But, um, Stan the man, police would later discover he had suffered serious short-term memory loss issues resulting from a motorcycle accident years before. Like, you know that movie Memento? He's that guy. His short-term memory was shot to shit, so he likely didn't have a clue. But if Marissa said he did, and she was a trusted friend, they lived together, then, uh, well, I guess you did. Though officers became instantly aware of taking anything he told them as fact, uh, as you can imagine. So not only was Stanley a highly unreliable witness, even by his own admission, but the physical evidence at the scene just didn't line up with what they were being told by him and Marissa. See, blood spatter analysis investigators were able to discern Dale had been attacked while lying on his left side, most likely asleep, not while on top of Marissa, as she had said. If he had been on top of her from where the door is to where he would have been, then he would have been hit on the left side of his head, not the right. Now, one officer did say he'd seen reddish marks on Marissa's neck. That, you know, maybe she was being strangled, but photos taken that night, lads, they barely show a blemish, let alone, you know, the kind of marks that would have been left had her account been true. You can Google these pictures. She looks grand, not a bother on her. You know, she's having a good time. She also had said, you know, she had... She had wildly, you know, clawed, scratched. Katie's got claws. She'd even bitten Dale, you know, in a furious attempt to get him to stop choking her. Yet again, the physical evidence, in this case, photos of her, show unbruised and freshly manicured hands. It didn't look like she had been scratching anything. It genuinely gets hard to keep track of what lie she is telling and why she is telling it. She, she would holy with lies, as my dad would say. 12 hours after the 911 call, Marissa was interviewed formally by detectives and not at the hospital, in the police station. Interviewed by detectives who <laughs> began to smell something stinky here. They knew the physical evidence didn't corroborate her story and Stan wasn't the attacker. It didn't take long to break Marissa and get her to admit she was the one who attacked Dale. Okay, now I have to warn you, the interrogation, it's pretty hard viewing and listening. Uh, not only because of Marissa's awful childish play acting and her constant giggling, but also kind of literally, the audio is really bad. It's very hard to make out what they're saying. And there's also a lot of very graphic descriptions of sexual assault and rape. It's, it's not easy to listen to. Especially knowing that her claims are already being unsubstantiated, that he wasn't attacking her. And then she'd, you know, almost beat him to death in his sleep by her own admission, and that she wouldn't have stopped hitting him had Stanley Cook not, you know, come in and taken the hammer off her. It's incredibly disturbing. Oh, and yeah, uh, Dale was still alive. Barely. But he was still alive. He was in the ICU, hanging on by a tread. In the interview, well, you know, she goes through the entire thing. He was horribly abusive, and one day she just... <laughs> snapped. Got the hammer, and went at him. And she, 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 you know, she goes between these harrowing 
details of the abuse she was suffering and what he was doing to her and then you know going to to giggling smiling and, and making these like weird little jokes i mean come on what is she me she grins she's grinning you know from ear to ear like a, a cheshire cat you know reminiscing about the beginning of their relationship and talking to the detective about you know how much fun her stan and dale all had a living together and then she's almost projecting her own personality onto dale she told the police dale he always wanted more money and was never satisfied that Dale was a greedy Gus over here. Her story, it changed so much and so often it's hard to comprehend just what her logic was beyond simply self-preservation. Uh, just with Jody Arias, she seems to be throwing whatever shit she can at the detectives and hoping, you know, some of it sticks. I mean, she just seems so used to people not confronting her and calling her out on her bullshit that she thinks that the police will just simply believe. She's so used to people believing her shite that she thinks the police will too, and that she'll be out of there in a couple of minutes with, get this, a cool crisp bag full of dollar bills because... Life insurance, baby. I mean, I, I can't do the dance right now, um, obviously. But you know, wherever you're listening to this, feel free to do the dance, the life insurance dance for me. Thanks. Marissa had taken out life insurance policies on Dale. Two of them. One being taken out only a couple of weeks prior, totaling 1.2 million. Instead of getting that, she was charged with attempted second degree murder. Not that she would spend long in jail, though. As Alan Flores, he would not only retain her a lawyer, he would bail her out and they would rekindle their intimate relationship. Their sought arrangement. While out on bail, with Dale still hanging onto life by his pinky, Marissa and Alan would cook up a scheme to once again try to have Stan Cook take the fall for the attack. They were determined. Even though she'd already been charged with it, you know, they needed to stick it on poor Stan. The man with no memory. Between February 5th and February 8th, Marissa would have Stan draft a letter of confession and would then have Alan not only edit the letter, like literally giving Alan the letter and then giving him a red pen, correcting it like it's a literature paper. And then Alan would also even drive Stan to two different police stations to try and get him to deliver the letter. Man, I feel so sorry for Stan the man because you know, they would obviously lie to him constantly, and he simply would not remember. He had no clue what he was doing at all. All the while, they were pushing him to admit to an attempted murder he didn't do. It's mad stuff. And how they thought this would work after she had, uh, already confessed to the police that she had done it and what she said matched with the evidence at the scene, it's, the entire thing is beyond laughable. And folks, we haven't even gotten to the most bizarre aspects of this case yet, so... Buckle up. On the 9th of February, just five weeks after the attack, Dale Harrell would succumb to his injuries. He'd endured an attack so violent, it's, it's beyond most people's comprehension. He had gone through several brain surgeries, including having chunks of his skull removed, but his body had it just had enough. The damage was too much, and Dale was done fighting. But you know what that means. Second degree murder just, uh, doodly doo, leveled up. And you can now scratch the attempted. Just a day later, police received another 911 call from Marissa. This time, she claimed to have been the victim of a random attack. What the shit? Yeah, you guys, you guys gotta listen to this. So, Marissa claimed she'd been out for a jog that morning. You know, a regular morning jog as you do when... Some mad lad had jumped from the bushes with a baseball bat and battered her. When she was found by the roadside, she did appear to have been badly beaten. She had a broken ankle and facial injuries. Again, you can Google these pictures. You can see she's got bruises on the face. But of course, as with everything Marissa DeVoe, things are never quite as they seem. So the police briefly looked for an attacker and, uh, well, they were thinking what you're thinking. And then, a week and a half later, Stan Cook walked into a Gilbert police station and asked to make a statement. Would you guys mind if I made a statement? He wanted to make a confession. Stan proceeded to tell the police a story. A story that is just so ridiculous in its stupidity that um, if Marissa DeVoe wasn't at the center of it, you know, you would have laughed at it. You, he, he would have been laughed out. So you get a lot of this, right? 
Marissa had not been able to claim the two life insurance policies totaling 1.2 million she'd taken out on Dale. She couldn't, as of course she was the suspect in his attempted murder, now murder. So Marissa, being, you know, just the absolute rocket scientist she was, she came up with a plan B. She still had those dollar signs in her eyes. If she couldn't claim Dale's life insurance, she would claim her own life insurance. Yeah, you heard that right. Marissa actually decided to claim on her own $500,000 life insurance policy. Her policy, it seems, had a provision for paralysis due to spinal injury. I can only imagine she was like looking through her her insurance manual and then just seeing, you know, payouts in case of yada yada yada. And then she saw spinal injury and like dollar signs in her eyes. Whoa, sign me the fuck up. So Marissa asked Stan if he would paralyze her. She, she was so greedy, she thought it was just an amazing idea to ask a man with short term memory issues to paralyze her. After all, I guess she was thinking, you know, he can break my spine and he won't remember doing it. So Stan said to her, um, sure, why not? I mean, okay, I'm not going to give him any credit either. He said to Marissa, hey, okay, um, sure, I'll paralyze you. How about I shoot you in the spine? Then he actually walked that back and he was like, you know, I'm not going to shoot you in the spine because, you know, maybe I'll kill you um, by accident. So then that plan they were kind of shooting shit about it and like, what's the best way to paralyze you and confine you to a wheelchair for the rest of your life? Like at this stage, I'm pretty sure this is straight out of the plot of an episode of It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Like, I'm sure they were kind of going through the list of all the ways um, she could be paralyzed. You know, she could be run over. She could be like stabbed in the back, maybe pushed from a tall building. Um, shot, sh being shot was kind of ruled out. So they're like scratching a noodle like, how will we break your spine? And honestly, in my opinion, I think they landed on the best, the best option, which was sledgehammer, baby. So how exactly does one break one's back with, with a hammer? I mean, they were like trying to debate this out. They, they had diagrams, they had pictures, or, you know, they had their crayons out with like stick figures. Okay, we should do it like this. Um... But what they landed on went a little something like this after after kind of hashing it out over over, you know, coffee and cigarettes. Then it kind of got to the point where Marissa, she started taking painkillers, popping pills, uh, and then they went into the bathroom together. Stan took out a sledgehammer and started beating the ever living shite out of Marissa. He would stop every now and then to to call her phone to support her story that she'd gone out for a run and been attacked by a stranger on the road. They wanted to make it look like, you know, she was out of the house, and so they weren't together, he would have to call her. This is the most insane shit I've ever heard in my life. Then, after he was done battering her, he carried her to his car and dropped her off down the street. Um, so you might have noticed there, there's a little bit of a difference between being paralyzed and having a broken ankle. So, I'm not sure why she kind of did anything at all about this. I mean, the money would have only been paid out if she had broken her spine. That didn't happen, but she still went ahead with the plan and called the police and pretended there was an attacker. So all she got was her friend to beat the shit out of her, which, I mean, uh, yeah, she probably kind of deserves it, but it's the stupidest shit I've ever heard in my life. I mean, the thought of them just like in the bathroom, uh, Marissa and uh, Stan, just like him, she just there like trying to chug like a bottle of whiskey trying to like knock out you know the pain and then him just like trying to like bash her spine in and she's like again again it's it's honestly the funniest shit ever uh just imagining this dumb and dumber these two dumb shits like trying to do this and then after a while she's just like fuck you know you didn't break my spine all right i give up close enough so stan would tell all of this to the police and he would again during that confession though attempt to take the fall for Dale's murder, saying, yeah, actually, also, by the way, I killed Dale, even though Marissa had A, already confessed to it, and B, they had evidence proving she had done it. A week later, Marissa DeVoe would be indicted on charges of first-degree murder with premeditation. So, the police had Marissa, they had Stan, and then they were led to Alan. They would search Alan Flores' house twice, 
Um, and then during one of the searches of Alan's house, they found a whole heap of uh, very illegal images of young children. So you know what that means. They should have offered him a deal, you know, that in exchange for him doing what they wanted him to do, they would, you know, forget about the whole kids stuff. Uh, and then, you know, at the end, just been like, actually, you know what, we changed your mind. Sorry. Sorry. Sorry about that. We'll forget all about the fact that you're an extremely fucked up person. Uh, psych! Put him in with the boys. The prosecution would offer Alan Flores a deal he could not refuse. That was a limited immunity in exchange for his testimony against Marissa. The trial would take place almost five years after the attack. Alan Flores would be a key witness for the prosecution and his testimony was absolutely damning for Marissa. He would tell the jury that Marissa had not only lied about killing Dale, but that she had asked around for someone to do it first. And then when she couldn't find anybody to kill Dale for her, she said she'd peck. You know, you want to do something, you want to get something done right, you got to do it yourself. And then she would simply tell the police Dale had, you know, become violent after a night of drinking and it was self-defense, which is exactly what she did end up doing. But it actually may have been Alan Flores who kind of started uh, Marissa's murderous plot to begin with, because Alan would tell the investigators that over the course of their affair, he'd given her loans, like several loans, totaling $360,000. So she obviously wanted to pay that back and thought of a real good idea of how to get the money. And I mean, I guess that's that's the reason why she wanted to get her own life insurance policy. She was desperate to pay Alan back. But Alan may have been a creepy pedo piece of shit, but he wasn't a complete idiot. Because he saw what Marissa did to Dale, uh, and he decided to keep a detailed ledger of every loan he gave her and have Marissa sign several promissory notes, and then, out of the fear of Marissa killing him like she had done her husband, he was also documenting all the stories and lies Marissa told him over the years. If anything happened to him, he would have evidence to, you know, show she had, she'd killed him. But, uh, hold up, he still continued their relationship? I mean, that's, that's odd to do that. Alan, you know, he would also tell the prosecutors that, you guys, I think Marissa was just using me for my money. Whoa, you think? He would go on to tell how Marissa had told him she was due a large inheritance from her dead stepfather's estate. Before she had plotted to murder her husband, Marissa initially told Alan how she'd pay him back. But of course, um, Marissa, you know, there was no inheritance and her stepfather was very much still alive. By the way, her stepfather was the person she told everybody, that's how she knew Alan, that Alan was her deceased stepfather's ex-boyfriend. Her stepfather who was alive and not gay. The defense, they attacked Alan's credibility, using the immunity deal to undermine his testimony, but the evidence, it was just so strongly in favor of the prosecution, and even Alan being a complete you know, shipwreck of a person, the justice heading for Marissa, that train ain't stopping. Marissa's eldest daughter, Rhiannon. She actually took the stand and supported her mother's story. She testified on her behalf that she'd witnessed Dale being physically and emotionally abusive to her mother. But the judge would later call this out in his closing remarks as obvious coaching by the defendant. I mean, you can't blame Rhiannon for, for trying to defend her mother. Most kids would do that for a parent who is about to be sent away for the rest of her life. Throughout the course of the trial, both the defense and the prosecution would call on expert witnesses to testify to Marissa's motivation and her mental state. The defense expert uh, would, unsurprisingly, whoa, find that Marissa suffered from PTSD and battered women's syndrome, while the prosecution's expert found that not only was Marissa not suffering from PTSD nor battered women's syndrome, but she was in fact a dangerous psychopath. What are the odds that, you know, the experts for the prosecution and the defense would find things supporting their argument? Huh. And also a former bouncer at the Knockers strip club, and he was also an ex-boyfriend of Marissa's, a lad named Travis. He would testify that Marissa had once asked him to take care of Dale. Travis, he turned her down, but Marissa had really been going around trying to get Dale killed, her beloved husband, a nice guy, for some time. Like, with everything that happened in this story, um, it really is the type of murder plot 
you know, life insurance plot, I can only describe as being the kind written in crayon, because that's how stupid everybody involved in this case was. The jury would deliberate for seven full days before finding Marissa guilty of premeditated first degree murder. Now, it was obvious fairly early on in the trial that there were enough aggravating factors to warrant this being a capital case, which means death penalty. And a lot of people wanted Marissa to get that, but in the end, she was spared, most likely due to her children. I don't even know where to start. With those words, Marissa Dubois began a very emotional and tearful account of the lives she ripped apart. Our children will have to carry this for the rest of their lives and they're gonna have to carry your dual image. And the dad they love that's gone. And the mom they love that's responsible for that. So to sum up, Marissa Devault, Dev, Devois, Marissa the Psycho, she beat her husband to death with a hammer to, to get some good old life insurance. Um, and this was because she was having an affair with a dirty old pedophile. A dirty old pedophile she would introduce to people as her dead stepdad's gay lover, neither of which were true. And she needed the life insurance because she owed him a lot of money. She then tried to blame beating of said husband with the hammer on a uh, memento man who lived in the same house with them. He won't remember. We'll just say he did it and will convince me he did it. Okay, that didn't work out. The life insurance plot then didn't work out because she was, you know, charged with the murder of him, right? So nothing was really going Marissa's way uh, from, from Jump Street with this whole stupid plot. So then she thought of, well, another way I can, you know, scratch your noodle, another way I can get money is if I paralyze myself, which the furthest she got in the, that was getting the shit beaten out of her and then breaking an ankle. So she did not, so that also didn't uh, pay out. All the while, her affair boyfriend older guy was keeping tabs on her in case she decided to simply kill him like she did Dale. All I have to say to that is, what? She is now serving life without parole in the Arizona Department of Corrections. Dale is still loved and remembered fondly as a guy who'd go out of his way to help strangers, to offer them rides as a hardworking, decent, funny human being whose life was sadly ended in the most violent of circumstances. And Shinne, a crazy story, lie upon lie, as Marissa would hold you at lies. It's kind of um, insane, especially when she tried to have herself paralyzed, paralyzed to get half a million dollars. This story is, well, lads. It's batshit, but uh, you know, once again, what's the number one rule for that chapter? The number one piece of advice always to give life insurance, probably a no-no. Thank you so much as always for listening. You know, I appreciate it. As I said, uh, you go to sleep tonight. I promise, I promise I'm gonna creep down your chimney like a spider and give you a smooch on the cheek. So look forward to that. Um, and I'll talk to you real soon in the next podcast. Uh, please, you know, subscribe to the podcast, my friends. Um, give us a, a, a really good rating and a review. That would be helpful so much. I couldn't, can't tell you enough. And, you know, if you're looking for a bit more, Mike, go listen to some more podcasts or go out, check out the That Chapter YouTube channel. Go on to YouTube and type in That Chapter and you'll see me. So look forward to that. Um, but yeah, I'll talk to you in a couple of days. But until then, take care of each other, take care of yourselves, because you know I love you. Mike out.